I grew up in a little farming town, Sycamore, Illinois, pumpkin capital of the world. I was in the middle of two girls and had a younger brother. So the oldest was the queen, the youngest was the princess, my brother was the prince, and then there was me. Many of my growing up years was spent trying to find my own identity. But even more than that, I wanted to be seen. In third grade, my mom bought me a new Easter dress. It was yellow with ruffles, a matching purse and a hat and shoes. It was so pretty. And I quickly put it on and I ran downstairs to show my dad. Daddy, look! Meh, C plus. And he laughed. And my mom laughed. Oh, Ronald. <laughs> and I laughed. And then I went to my bedroom and I cried. Because I was just a little girl who longed to be the apple of her daddy's eye. I felt missed. I felt invisible. I was searching for something. I wanted my dad to see me. He, though, was in his own little world of home, TV, work, and scotch and waters with a twist. My invisibility continued, even when I got crowned homecoming queen my senior year in high school. The next morning, my picture was on the front page of the local paper. But the only thing that my dad could see was the homecoming king kissing me on my cheek. What the hell is that boy kissing you for? He didn't say, gosh, honey, I'm so proud of you. He didn't say, you are so beautiful. He didn't say, you sure look happy, Jeannie. And I know I'm not alone in these longings. I believe the human spirit thrives for human connection that is real. And I think there's something inside of us that dies without it. Gentle words of affirmation feed our soul. And when we don't connect, we don't connect. With my desire to be seen, I became a person who sees other people. In 1995, my youngest went to first grade, and I went to graduate school, and I became a therapist. And as a therapist, I sat with hundreds and hundreds of people on my couch, and time and time again, they would tell me of their desire to be seen that they were desperate, desperate for human connection, that they wanted to be known and to be cared about, to be told that they mattered, to be listened to, to be understood. And I understood these connections and these longings to be seen as one of our greatest human needs. One of our greatest human needs, because we all know we need water and food and shelter to survive. Babies need human touch. But I'm here to tell you that what's even more important is this connecting with one another. It's like when grandma dies six months after grandpa, it's not about her health. It's about their loss of connection. I'm going to tell you a story that changed my life. It was 2009, and my youngest daughter just finished packing her suitcase to go to South Africa for six weeks for a college missions trip. And after she went to bed, I quickly grabbed her little teddy bear, I wrote her some love notes, I grabbed this little pewter heart, I snuck into her, her room, I unzipped her suitcase, 
and I hid those treasures inside. This was my baby going halfway around the world alone and by herself. I hid these mementos of home in her suitcase, hoping that it would help her to feel connected to us and to know she was loved. Well, three weeks later, in the middle of the night, the phone rings, and it's Melissa, and she's crying hysterically. That small little pewter heart that I had hid in her suitcase, she had lost it, and it was gone. And after our phone call, I realized that through that little heart, she did feel connected. She knew that we were holding her. She knew we were praying for her, and she knew she was loved. Well, about an hour later, she called back. Fortunately, she called back, and her friend Ivor had gone back to the restaurant because he knew how much that heart meant to her. He crawled around on the floor, and he found it. And three weeks after that, my oldest daughter Kelsey and I were going to South Africa to see Melissa. At the last minute, I threw a bag of hearts into my suitcase, and halfway across the Pacific Ocean, I had an idea. A couple days later, the three of us were in this small, cramped, smelly airplane headed for a safari, and there was this pretty flight attendant. Who was serving warm Diet Cokes, a little bag of potato chips, and she was exuding joy like I've never seen. I found one of those little pewter hearts. I gave it to her, and her eyes immediately filled with tears. And then there was this couple who missed their flight home and couldn't see their kids. And Melissa gave the mom a heart, and she burst into tears. And the dad had tears as well. And then Kelsey gave a heart to a server at a restaurant. And the next day we went back, and the server came running up to us, saying, "Oh my gosh, I'm going to carry this heart always, and I'm going to never forget you." So wow, these little hearts. The rest of our trip, we continued to spread them, and we gave them to people who looked like they were struggling. We gave them to people that we caught doing something kind. We gave them to people who looked like they needed some love. And this, this is what the heart looked like. It's not perfectly shaped. It's not shiny. It has a few dents in it, just like all of ours. But it became a symbol. A totem of small yet powerful moments of human connection. A moment to be seen, a moment to feel loved. I didn't always get it from my dad, but together with my daughters, we were going to make sure that people did. So we were on the flight home, and my little bag was empty. And we said we've got to continue to share hearts when we get home. Our hearts were so full of love from seeing people, from connecting with people, from hearing strangers' stories. We knew we had to continue to share them, and it's now become our family mission. Fast forward to today, and there's over 30,000 of these little hearts that have been spread around the world by me. By Melissa, by Kelsey, and hundreds of others that we call heart spreaders, and we've realized together that when we see other people, that we get seen. Well, in the hustle of the everyday, I want to tell you. That you have the power to change a person's life, whether it's someone you know or whether it's a stranger. I've had the opportunity to witness so many people receiving these hearts, and people just melt. I place it in the palm of their hand. I look them in the eye, and I say, "This is for you. 
It's a reminder that you're loved. Or this is for you. You're awesome. Or this is for you. And you know what? Things are going to be okay. Okay, I want to challenge you all here tonight. Every one of you sitting here, that starting now and going forward, that you would really see one another and find your own version of a heart. Maybe it's a, a hug. Maybe it's a guy's with a cigar. I don't know. Maybe it's a little heart written on a note. But every day, let's spread some love. Every day, let's intentionally connect with someone. So I see you. And you matter. And you are so loved. And this little heart right here, this one's for you, Dad. I know you loved me. And I love you too. Thank you.